So I think his house, uh, which debuted on Netflix in time for Halloween, is one of the best debuts I've seen in a really long time. And it is Remy's first feature film, isn't it, Remy? It is, yeah, the very first. Well, the story is, and I'm sure that everybody who's tuning in tonight has seen it uh, because it's been available on BAFTA and of course it's been available on Netflix now for a month or so. So hopefully not too many plot spoilers. I do apologise if we ruin anything for you, but presumably you're all tuning in just to hear more having watched the movie. But Remy, maybe we could just start off with you firstly, because it is your first film and I believe you came on board to develop, to develop yeah. an idea that was already there. Yeah. So maybe you can just tell us how it all came about, really. Totally. So before this film, I was making commercials and fashion films and stuff. And the production company I was signed to shared office space with two producers. And so whenever I went in to see them, they were there. And we used to talk about how one day I'd like to make feature films. And they mentioned that the project, they, wanted, they were developing an idea uh, to make a horror film around the immigrant experience, but they weren't quite getting it. They weren't quite hitting the nail on the head. So they asked me if I wanted to pitch them my take, my, my version. And so I pitched them pretty much the film that we made. And yeah, they liked it and you made it. Wow, had you always been a horror film fan growing up? Were you in a fictionado? I do, I like to scare myself. Um, I like, yeah, tension and suspense, those are, that's my jam, that's, those are my thrills, I love it. Well, as you mentioned, the story is of a young couple who flee South Sudan and they come to the UK, they find asylum. The one rule they're told is that they can't leave the house, but the house turns out to be one of horror and trauma. Uh, so, Wumi, maybe I can ask you first, of course, you're... You're a marvellous heroine, but how did you feel when you were first approached to take the part? Because this is of a couple, and it seems to me uh, that Rial really has a lot of the, the, the strength of the couple and the, the strength to face up to their, their circumstances. What do you think? Um, so I uh, auditioned for the part, and so when I read the script, I just fell in love with it. I thought it was so... Um, clever I thought it was so emotional I thought it was so scary and I wasn't really sure if the the like the Apeth the beast was real um there was I was like is it even real or is it all in their mind so I was just really like uh attracted to it and so when I got the role I was really chuffed because I just really, really wanted to be a part of telling the story. Um, I want to take it any role, by the way, <laughs> any role, Remy. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, and so like Rial, I just found her so like from the beginning, just she's she just has this kind of deep kind of, I don't know, it just feels like something swirling underneath, but it, it feels like still kind of still water on top. And, um, but she's also really, I find her really funny too. Like she's, she always, she finds room for humor and, and um, warmth. And, um, you know, I just thought she was just so well-rounded and someone who is, someone who doesn't run away from fear. She runs to it, she listens to it. She um, questions so much and isn't afraid of any answers, which I thought was quite extraordinary. I think personally, I would have been more like uh, Bob in that situation, <laughs> like get out of my house. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah. Shope taking the role of, of Ball. I mean, he's, he's a guy who, who is almost fulfilling that traditional role of trying to take care of his family. Mm -hmm. uh, what appealed to you? I mean, both you and we uh, have, are very experienced actors in terms of your film and TV roles. Why did you want to do this movie? Well, uh, it's really interesting that you bring up the point about that traditional role of wanting to take care of his family, you know? Um, I think one of the main things that attracted me to the character of Bol was that sort of, ugh, there's a whole transformation of what masculinity is, what it has been, what it's looking like in the utopia we're trying to create. And I thought that this was like an interesting interrogation of that. For me, both as an African man and as a man, I thought that there was a lot of that traditional way of thinking to mine in the character of Bob 
as an African man, he really feels like he has to be the leader of his family, has to provide and his rule is law, you know, and he knows what's best for everybody. So he's going to lead from the front. Whereas I find that if Bol had had the wherewithal to just sit down and had a conversation with his wife about how he was feeling, you know, talking about his emotions rather than hiding from them, uh, it would have been a very short film. But I suppose that's <laughs> part of the <laughs> that's part of the journey of the, that the characters go on. <laughs> yes, you, you you make an extremely good points there. But I suppose it's it's an incredibly human thing, isn't it, to try and cope, mm-hmm. to try and confront, to try and confront it, and not sit down and talk about your feelings as well especially with a man like this. Mm -hmm. Remy, do you think that it's taken a while considering the horror of the immigrants and the refugee experience? Why do you think it's taken quite a long time to be able to bring a film that that mixes the idea of a a house of horror with, with the refugee experience? Oh, oh gosh, I don't know. Um, yeah, I don't know if I could answer that question. Um, I know for myself, I was just, I was making something that was talking about assimilating in a new culture and trying to, I guess, feel safe within a culture that's none, is at best not quite sure whether it's comfortable with you. And, um, I guess that comes from a kind of a place of growing up in this country and f- seeing those seeing those arguments being played out from not just a, a political or public way, but in a kind of personal and emotional way from friends, family, and you know the people I've grown up with in in, the, in England. And so I couldn't tell you why it hasn't happened before, but I definitely feel like this is these are conversations that are being had at the moment for sure and I'll come back to your research in the moment but just to ask both the actors as well I mean the the refugee experience can be a horror story we see that in the first few moments of his house we see it when they lose their child in the water they we see it when they're in a detention center I mean that must have touched you very much when you read the script and actualized it on set, you know, and possibly you thought that in a way you're, you're humanizing the experience, you're giving it a face when all it is so often is statistics. Yeah, yeah. I think. Sorry, no, please. <laughs> um, no, I was actually going to quote you because you always say that um, we talk about refugees are always people who are spoken about, never necessarily spoken to. And like, you just, and that's that's a direct quote from Shopper. I can't take (laughs) credit for that. Um, And I I think that is the reason why, like um, I just fell in love with the script so much because as someone who thinks that they care and they think that they're open and like, you know, every, you know, everyone's, you know, it's everyone's right and um, to have safety and a place to call home. I had never really thought about the individual stories. And um, I think it's, I think they're all tra- traumatic. I think they're all um, horrific because why would anyone, the, the, the fact that someone has to leave their home um, to seek refuge and asylum in, in another country. I mean, there's ne- there's never a reason other than like survival and and hope and thriving and so I think it's all that I mean there's all always that kind of terror of like horror of humanity which instigates the the need to leave one's home like one's land one's ancestry you know one's language you you, you you're, you're you're leaving everything that really truly makes you who you are um so I I just thought it was so um eye-opening to me and I just realized like yeah we need to we need to hear from them we need to like and it's our duty to do as best as we can because as much as Rial and Bal aren't real people their circumstances and the the instigating circumstances are real and the traumas are real so it's like we have to honor them and all of those experiences to follow on from what Wumi said, I think we shared 
like all of us that were making this film, a great responsibility yeah. for the story that we were in charge of, you know? Um, it was really important that we were nuanced and accurate and not general at all, because whilst, as Wumi says, it's not a biopic, they're not people who necessarily lived, they represent people who are living and who have suffered. So um, it was really, I mean, Remy can speak probably a bit more on it, but it was really important that we didn't cross certain boundaries, but the the authenticity was really important to us. Of course. And Remy, maybe, yeah, you can speak a little bit about your research. And also I'm really interested in something I think that you've spoken about before, and which is very much in, the, in some of the first lines of the film about this idea of a good immigrant. And we, we hear it in what they say, in this couple, what the couple say when they first come to the country. Yeah, totally. I think there's this idea or this desire for people when there's an, when someone's an immigrant in this country, the need for them to be a good immigrant, and that we tend to only feel safe or comfortable when there's an, if there's an immigrant, if they fulfill certain roles, whether they, you know, they're a hard worker, whether they're morally very clean, very, um, um, very um, polished. And so to have, I guess, to have gray areas often is, is a sign of failure in terms of an, an immigrant. And I really wanted to talk about that in this film, or at least crit critique it. Um, in terms of the, the research from the very beginning when I started writing, we was doing research, it was myself and also a researcher involved, uh, a woman called Lucy Witten. And together we were researching not just, um, well, quite a few different things. We researched about the, the immigration system or the asylum system in the UK. And that's how we discovered, I guess, the central pillar of the story, which is when you are an asylum seeker, you're given you are given temporary accommodation, but you have to, to stay there, you have to live under really draconian rules. And for example, you're, you're not allowed to just change homes, you're not allowed to have a job, you have to stay put. You're given a very small uh, weekly allowance. And for many people who just arrive in this country and are, I guess, really eager to start this new chapter in their life, it can be very, um, it could be very re-traumatizing because you're forced to stay put and you're forced to relive the things you've gone through. And, and it, it's such a strange and bizarre um, way of treating people. Um, it, it, it began, I guess, the process of creating this, this story. And so we researched that, but we also researched into the migration system from Africa into Europe. Um, and we, a lot, we did a lot of research in first-hand accounts, so talking to people and getting people's personal stories of, their, um, of being in some seek in the UK. Mm. Just to say that in seven or eight minutes, we'll open it up to the audience. I can see a few questions have already popped in the Q&A uh, chat function. Please do add your questions and we will come to them. Absolutely really keen to, to get your take on his house. Uh, just to follow on from what you said, Remy, but actually maybe um, Chopin, you could you could talk about this really. I think Bol is particularly keen for this chance and really, really wants to take it. And we see how he goes out and gets his haircuts on the first mm -hmm. morning. Maybe you could just talk talk me through his his gradual disillusionment. I suppose. Uh, what do you mean? Oh, just I suppose that in in some ways he sets out with hope and excitement but in that's you know and, and we see him trying to join in with the, the, the singing about Peter Crouch that kind of thing and it's it's a gradual process isn't it of almost him being worn down of course by the horror that he's experiencing but uh, there is yeah. a certain trajectory there. I don't know I think art is entirely subjective and there's so many different things that can be drawn from any single piece and I'm, I'm wary of being too prescriptive in my answer mm -hmm. But, uh, and I think my, my interpretation will be slightly different from Wumi's, slightly different from Remy's, even though we all worked on this thing together to create it. But in terms of Bol's disillusionment, I don't know. I, th I think there's an element of him that would press on with this 
um, optimism, this like ridiculous yeah. optimism. Um, and it, it really is just the, the specter, the path, and it's um, the breakdown mm-hmm. of his relationship with his wife that gets in the way of him achieving those goals. Those are his obstacles. And they, yeah. see, and they become insurmountable. I don't think it's necessarily anything to do with the environment because if there was no path, then I think the, 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 the gap between the two of them, Bol and Real, will continue to, to split because of what they want, because what they want is very different. But um, yeah, I think there is this, I'm going to make the best of what I've got. This is still the land of milk and honey, even though it's not mm. as beautiful and or, as, or as warm as we were told that it was going to be, you know? Um, so when that's why I asked you to, to, to repeat the question, because I'm not yeah. sure that his disillusionment comes from anything. I, I'm not sure disillusionment is necessarily the right word. I think he's definitely worn down by his experiences in the house and the, the separation and detachment he feels from his wife and like also the, traumatic the post-traumatic stress disorder that he's suffering as a consequence of being a migrant and making those crossings and having to leave his home and being um in a in a war-torn country but um but yeah i'm not sure anything would have stopped him from from being optimistic or being desperate to continue this new chapter of his life were it not for the events of the film no Absolutely, fair enough. And Wimmy as well, playing somebody with post-traumatic stress disorder as well. I mean, did you do a lot of research into the experience of coming into a, into a new place? Because I think that we all really empathise with Rial and I particularly empathise with her when she's trying to take her first walk around the new town and, you know, just, just find her way and we see the greyness of her surroundings. Uh, maybe you can just just tell me a little bit about how you empathise with with that struggle of hers. I think um, like the research I did initially was about the journey from. Well, first of all, it's about where they're from, the the life that they lived, um, mm. and the reason why they had to flee. Kind of filling that whole world up in one's mind. Um, to know what you're sacrificing, um, or what was, what what's been taken from you, um, and then it's the journey from Sudan to the UK. So, like Remy said, we had video testimonials of people who had done either some of that journey, a bit of that journey, a different journey, but from Africa to. Um, the UK or from Europe to the UK um, uh, so listening to just what people have experienced and layering that into um, Rial's history um, and making that those that image and those those experiences vivid and something that you can pull on um, that I guess is that I think that's the biggest challenge actually is to make all of that real because you don't really you don't really live you don't well we don't live through it but even in like the the playing of it it's under it's a controlled environment it's a safe environment um you know we have breakfast lunch and dinner you know so you have to you have to really you it's a lot of work for your imagination I, I find anyway and then it's just about meeting Rial where she is and moving forward with knowing who, what she's been through. And that's a, a, a mixture of every everything. Me, just me, were me, um, my relationship with Chopin, him as Ball, me as Rial and Remy. It's a, it's a whole alchemy of like, and obviously the script. So it's all of that. And that's kind of like the conversations, the, 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 the challenges on set, it kind of all f- informs how, you know, how sh- she feels, <laughs> you know, every, every day. So the empathy kind of comes from just, just believing, believing in the past and believing in the present. Like it's just, a, it's just a, it's an act of b- belief. And that's where the empathy comes from for me. Does that, make, does, that, does that make sense? You just have to believe it really, really hard. 
Just a couple more questions before we go on to the Q&A. Remy, you decided yeah. to use the set. The, the set was in Tilbury. Yeah. Uh, what, what made you choose that area of Essex? Um, I guess a few different reasons. Um, firstly, I guess, when, through the, mostly through the research and usually asylum seekers are given houses in suburban areas usually. Um, less, I guess, uh, areas with a more deprived areas than not, um, I guess, places with like cheap housing stock. And so it was about finding a kind of suburban place that had a, sim had a similar feel to the places we had researched. But also I, I really liked the place because it doesn't feel quintessentially um, British. And I think um, for many asylum seekers coming, or anyone actually outside of the UK coming to the UK, I think the the West or the UK has been very good at um, exporting a certain image of itself. Um, this kind of soft power it sends to the rest of the world, this kind of Britishness and this kind of sense of proud empire and this kind of boastfulness um, that is so consistent people, it's very easy to believe in it. And so for many people, when they come into the UK, they're very um, taken back by how unlike the, how unlike the reality is to the image it sends itself. And I, I really like Tilbury because for asylum seekers arriving to the UK, it's very clearly quite disorientating and, and not what you'd expect. And, it, and I, I, I thematically, it seemed to make sense. And also because Tilbury is support in Essex and many people when they're coming to the UK, they pass through Tilbury. And so it also had that thematic feel to it as well. A quick question about your amazing third character, the immigration officer played by Matt Smith, yeah. of course. Um, you know, tell me how you uh, how you got Matt Smith on board, and it's it's a really interesting role for him. Actually, he may not be in that many scenes, but they're really great scenes that the ones he appears in. Totally, one one of my favorite days is the day we shot Matt and Shops together um, across the table, and they were both ad libbing and bouncing stuff, and it was fireworks it was magic i love that day he was um um he, he I, I guess he read the scripts he really liked it and was um quite keen on doing something different um and playing against type and yeah he was really down for it it was great working with him you're right about that scene that is brilliant uh, absolutely yeah. brilliant uh, let's go on to the Q&A now. Um, we've had four, a few, quite a few questions in, so I'll do my best. Sorry if I'm peering into the screen. I think I need glasses after lockdown, I'm afraid. <laughs> um, this is a question from Simon Drew. So it's, me, yes, it's just too much peering in. It's, it's destroyed <laughs> what left my eyesight. I'm really sorry. Okay, so question from Simon Drew. Uh, how did you film the sequences in the boat? Uh, was it in a studio? What problems did you have to solve? And Simon says, I need to shoot something similar. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we shot the boat stuff um, on the tank, on the tank, um, the tank stage in Pinewood, actually. Um, uh, what's the second part of the question? How was it? What problems did we solve? Obstacles. Um, yes. Panicking actress. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, yeah, we almost had, um, you, could you swim? You couldn't swim before. No, I could swim. I just, I'm just having a fear <laughs> of drowning <laughs> in the sea. And I thought that it was going to be in the sea. And then when I saw the size of the tank, I was like, it might as well be the sea. And <laughs> you've got your clothes and you've got people panicking around you. I, I just was like really freaked out by the people drowning by me. I did not like that. So when was an obstacle. <laughs> <laughs> now, you know what? It's more like... <laughs> well, you know what? There was a lot of, like, like I could... 
I was very lucky to have an incredibly experienced first AD and also second and third. And so like that scene, you know, there was um, uh, obviously a pool and a boat and stunt actors, and but also um, a lot of just, um, just a lot of extras and um, supporting characters. And so the, the, the ADs really, I mean, they really had to harness all these different elements to, to make sure that we shot the day. And so they, they were the ones who really took on the obstacles. I was had the easy job, I just said action and cut. <laughs> <laughs> it's difficult, isn't it? Because it must be such a traumatic scene, thinking about it and talking about it. And when you have to do it, you're in the mechanics of it, you know, and it's, uh, I, I suppose, the autopilot takes over almost. Yeah. But also like with them, um, uh, there was young people, there were young yeah. people on the boat and it just, that having those kids on the boat helped you kind of really always connect back to the story. Because mm -hmm. if we were just on a boat full of um, stunt men, uh, stunt people, it would have felt like, safer but also um you uh, you would probably just kind of go to the mechanics a lot more the fact that you have children and minors on the boat with you, you you're responsible for it kind of just hits home like how uh, how terrifying and dreadful it must like be to put your child on a boat like that um and we're yeah. in a controlled environment it kind of always it always brought it back home seeing those kids around and it wasn't even, um, it wasn't social shops. It wasn't even like to size in terms of the real thing. Like the real thing would be crowded by even more people. It's just like, right. obviously in, to make sure it's safe for everyone, we couldn't overcrowd it in the same way that in reality it would have been. So what you're seeing is actually much more, um, um, not as extreme as reality. Um, when we said it in previous, uh, Q and A's that we've had on this. It's just like what we researched and what we went through performing these characters was like a sliver of the experience of what real people went mm. through. Like it's incomparable. We've tried to tell a story the best that we could, but yeah. it, and and we're, we're hoping to share it with people so that we can all empathize and relate and understand and put faces to the statistics, as you said earlier, but when we were like preparing for the shot in the tank and you had all the stuntmen and women sat in the boat and then we started loading the children on, that was, that was the most painful thing I've ever experienced in my career so far actually, because I think that's the closest that I got to understanding how, how hot, terrible life must be for you to not only risk your own life, but to risk the life of your child or other family members, because it must be better on the other side, you know? There's, there, is, there is no way that people would do that to themselves or their children if, if it wasn't totally abject where they're coming from. Um, but even then, it was a controlled environment. Those children were inherently safe and they were chaperoned and they were scuba divers around, like everything was okay. But to see them step onto the boat, I, I can't, yeah. Yeah, that was just, it was just really ha harrowing a moment as a human, let alone as an actor, to see that happen. And then to think that it's happening at the same time with much higher stakes and actual lives on the line. Um, yeah, it's sort of beggar's belief. Thank you. Thanks for, for, for telling us that. Um, thank you. I will, I'll just move on to the next question. Uh, it's by somebody who is anonymous, uh, but asking both, both you actors, uh, what was your process for learning a new language for the film? Uh, did you learn it to a basic level or did you learn the dialogue phonetically? Phonetically. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I, I we had um, Mawan who, I don't know what you describe him as, like a, cons a, a dink consultant. consultant. Yeah. yeah, you kind of told us about the culture and 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 helped us learn the language. Um, 
Chopper is much better at learning languages than me. And he was like, oh, he knew my, he knew what my words meant. <laughs> I knew what he was saying, but I didn't know which m word was which. He knew e each word. And I was like, oh no, I'm just going to wait until I think you're done. <laughs> and then I'm going to say my line back. <laughs> I, um, I, I really love languages anyway. Um... But I, unfortunately, no, I did. I still didn't learn Dinka to any sort of conversation, conversational level. There wasn't really enough time, you know. No. Um, no. But yeah, it was it was very practical. It's to for the story rather than as a leisurely activity. But I do enjoy learning languages anyway. So, Moran Morat is um is uh, he's a lecturer um, from South Sudan who lives in the UK now, and he came on board as a consultant so he was with us during the pre-production and the production and also the post-production every day just um making making filling us in educating us where we needed to be educated and watching what we were doing and making sure that we was doing everything properly and um we wasn't making any awful faux pas anywhere <laughs> brilliant thank you i will move on because we have got quite a few questions uh, Shamara Murray, uh, we'd like to know, she, uh, Shamara doesn't say who in particular this is targeted at. Uh, can you discuss your research around a case study for an audience in horror with the black community? And did you experience any pushback to feature black stars? Exciting to see more in this genre. Thank you for sharing. What's the first part of the question? Uh, can you discuss your research around a case study for an audience in horror with the black community? And did I'm, not you... I'm not sure what that means. Um, I think it means so there might be a couple of there might be a typo in there. Shamara, you're welcome to to clarify <laughs> if we can see. Uh, can you discuss your research in the case study? for an audience. I think it's talking about the horror experience and were you researching it uh, within the black community? Yeah. Or is, um, it, is, is the question more like, are you, were you, how did you know that the that black people wanted to watch a horror film? Like, is, because in, in terms of horror in the black community, it seems that seems to be what the question's asking. I'm, not, I'm really not sure. I can say that in terms of pushback. Well, I'm not quite sure either. But, uh, in, in, ter in terms of pushback, I don't think I, I got any pushback in, at all in, in, that, in that regard. I, I, I do think generally um, the film industry is always eager for original content and, and new stories. And so I think people really especially you were sending the script out, they were really excited to, 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 to tell a story that felt different. And so I never really got pushback um, from, from, yeah, from anyone. Okay, lovely. Well, let's move on just because there's some time. Shamara has put yes. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm not sure what Great. was <laughs> right. quite with what we got right. I hope there was some answer there. That I hope so too. But... Perfect question. Sorry about that, Shamara. Uh, there's two questions here. Uh, one from Ravi. Uh, truly loved the film. Ravi says, saw it at the drive through Netflix screening. Amazing. Oh, cool. Uh, and Ravi says, what was the most challenging moment for each of you? And then there's also a question from somebody called Kelly. Hi, Kelly. Kelly Waltman, what was the most challenging, difficult scenes uh, to take? So for the three of you, if you can think about your challenges. I think the, the most challenging, harrowing experience for me on the set was the one that I mentioned earlier about seeing those kids step onto the boat. Um, mm. Just to absorb myself of answering this question any further. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would say the same but and then there was also the technical for, for the for the emotional um side of it that was definitely the hardest thing to shoot and then also the technical side of just being in water all day and um with people dr drowning was just for me emotionally very like I was very very stressed being around that um, yeah, thankfully I had Shopper by my side because I was a bit like, I don't like this, I don't like this. 
Um, I guess, I mean, one of the hardest things, the hardest scenes to shoot was definitely the bus scene at the end of the film in Morocco. Um, that was just oh, yeah. in terms of everything needing to come together, uh, shooting, in, shooting in Africa, a huge, um, huge supporting artists and extras, and then bus down, and then obviously getting like making sure that we shoot like really vital story story beats and and getting that all shot um that was definitely a very difficult day but mostly i think the hardest things for me are it's really it's often could be seemingly the boring stuff like building the scare sequences and stuff and shooting things like plates and stuff that you probably don't really if you was if you didn't know what I was doing it just seems like we're shooting lots of like empty walls and dark spots and moving towards dark shadows and stuff and it, it, it seems really boring but making sure that we have all the tools we need to make mm. these scenes come together that was that's the fun. Mm. Ravi's also had got one more question in as well, asking uh, Remy, any film uh, inspiration that fed Ooh. into the vision of this film? And I think that a lot of people have asked you about Romero zombie movies, maybe, but please, were there, what, what were your influences, if any? I guess I really, I really enjoy haunted house stories and movies. And, and I guess they're probably, for this specific film anyway, um, it was always, I was really inspired by watching lots of haunted house films, whether it's like um, The Innocents or um, The Others um, or like some of the, the, the Japanese stories, it's Japanese movies, Jay Hollis, like The Ring or The Grudge. Um, yeah. Uh, this question is anonymous. I think it's to Remy again. Which mm. advice, what advice would you give to someone who wanted to enter the film industry as a writer or director? How did you get into the industry yourself? Oh, make stuff. I mean, yeah, 100% just make stuff. Doesn't matter if it's good or bad, or if it's big or tiny. Like, that's the only, if there was only, if there was one thing I could, look back in my past and say like that was like a good thing to do um it was that when i finished uni me and my friend from school luke white we joined together and we started just shooting stuff on his dad's camera and putting it out into the world um not not caring and that was the hard part to kind of like let your ego put your ego to, to the side and say like We'll just make stuff and if it's good it's great but if it's not good that's that's okay too but just to keep going until you you find yourself and i would say so i'd recommend that to anyone else um just make stuff okay question here from uh, who's anonymous as well i've dealt with the home office immigration system for years your depiction of the immigration agents was so accurate, especially in the light of the deportation of black British people planned for next week. Uh, which organizations did you work with for research on the immigration system? Oh. If, well, if we, any. Were, we were talking to some charities. I you know, wish I could remember which ones they were now. I, I can't, it wasn't, that it was less the organizations, more like Lucy specifically was talking to people like, uh, to, to like lawyers um, and to p other people who had done research with contacts. And yeah, so I wish I could give you more specific names, but I don't think I can. Okay. Thanks. But thank you that the, um, you felt that we had captured them. One, um, th one of the things you really, you learn about is how dehuman dehumanizing bureaucracy is and how when you have a system that's so big, no one can really be held accountable. It's always mm -hmm. someone else's problem and you're always kind of passing the buck. And I found that fascinating. And so I really wanted to show 
not that the people working in the system are inherently evil or inher inherently cruel, but they were part of a system that enabled people to always pass you on to some, someone else or something else. Have the actors got anything to add at this point, just before we move on to another question? Mm. Uh, it's a question asking, I think, Remy, you're probably best place to answer this again. Uh, how long did the project take to go from script to screen? And uh, was, was the cultural, uh, was choosing South Sudan uh, deliberate right from the start? Um, yes. When I started work, writing and everyone wanted to tell it from South Sudan, I found it's, um, it's something that's happening right now. It's, it's a very present issue. And so I really wanted to tap into um, the world today. Um, and in terms of how long it took it, um, so I got on board on the project at the end of 2016 and I wrote it in 2017 and then yeah, we filmed it in 2018 and finished it at the end of 2019. <laughs> then premiered the Sundance at the beginning of this year. And the midnight section, which was a yeah. wonderful place mm. for, for this film to debut. And I'm sure it feels like a wonderful dream right now being at uh, Sundance. Yeah, I mean, it was, who knew that it would be the very last time I'd see everyone? <laughs> <laughs> I, know. <In> <laughs> I know it was yeah it was but, lovely uh, i i hear you um and zoom is an amazing tool to have during 2020 but yeah. i totally understand it doesn't quite make up for uh the joy of seeing everyone in in the flesh at all uh, yeah. we've just gone a minute over um our allotted time so i'm afraid we can't take more questions. They were fantastic questions and they came thick and fast and just so much love for the film as well, which is, is, is really wonderful. Uh, I just wanted to ask, I suppose, as, as a final thought, I think his house is so powerful because it does deal with that mental trauma as real horror. Um, do you think that his house is, is part of this, this canon of work that really does say that the, the greatest horror can be inside our head, the, the trauma that people suffer? I think Remy was very, very specific that there was definitely <laughs> a monster in the house <laughs> that we're making a horror film. <laughs> but I do think that's something that attracted um, both myself and Remy to the project. And I, the greatness comes from Remy himself was that there, you could take the monster out of the, out of the story and it would be equally as harrowing. So mm -hmm. whilst we have created a horror film and there is definitely a monster, there is a lot of scope to, to, to support that argument that some of the greatest horrors of our experience and the human condition are often inside our heads. Well put. And, and the horrors we do to each other as well. Yeah. yeah. Unfortunately. Wumi, you were going to say something, apologies. No, I, I totally agree. I, you could take that monster out and it'd be, and, and I, I read it thinking it wasn't real. Like I kept on saying, Remy, are you sure it's real, <laughs> real? Um, and I really loved that. And I just think, yeah, I think it's a great um, uh, vehicle. Horror is a really great vehicle because you get that empathy because uh, your heart's beating, your heart is beating and you're scared and you're terrified and, and it's in the safety of your own home. And all of a sudden, that now you can feel a little iota of what that person in in that scenario is feeling. So I just I do think it's um, you know it's it's such a I mean I say it like I say that meaning like of course like um, the fear that you feel in your house is nothing in comparison to to the fear that someone is experiencing as they leave their home and making such a perilous journey. And I, and, but it, but it's, it's a slight tether bet between you and them and um, that feeling, that emotion. And I think it's uh, so well, uh, so needed instead of like being lectured or like, you know, you know, a monologue, it's like to actually feel something as, as, as terrifying as that is, it's, it's necessary for, I think, and I think, um, yeah. 
And it and it very final thought because we've got, oh, I've got a couple of minutes. But I guess who who'd have thought in twenty twenty, you know, a house would become so important. That feeling of being safe and happy within <laughs> within mm. the house. It's it it did take on an extra dimension just watching it for the first time. You know, in a, in a mm. home where you're not safe. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for the three of you and. Thank you, BAFTA, for hosting this Q&A. Uh, thank you for joining us, everybody, very much. And thanks very much for Netflix as well. And of course, if you do want to catch up with His House again, it is on Netflix. So, Shopee, really, thank you so much for company this evening. Really, thank really you, it's been a pleasure. Good thanks for having us. With, um, as See it you goes, later. Goes forward. And Remy, thank you so much, everybody. Take care, everybody. Thanks for joining. Cheers. Bye. 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 Bye.